Good evening, Stirring Family. Excited to be here to worship with you tonight. Won't you sing with us?
Hey, my Stirring family, I am so excited you could join us online for this new sermon series. You know, something I was thinking about this week was how I love having the opportunity to go back during the week and listen to a worship song or re-listen to a sermon through Hope's website or even the Stirring's Facebook page. Just this week, I shared a Stirring service with a friend after a conversation about some struggles she was having. And while you're there on the website checking out our past services, please take a moment to drop us a prayer request or give your offering. We still wanna connect with you while we're not being able to meet in person. During this worship hour, we are celebrating communion together virtually. To prepare, please set aside a piece of bread or half a cracker. It's totally okay if it's larger than what we're normally used to when we celebrate communion face to face. Also, set aside the number of cups needed in your family and pour about a quarter of a cup of any type of juice in each cup. It can be grape, orange, apple, cranberry, or any liquid you have at home. Again, don't let the details deter you from participating. We must slow the rate of infection of the coronavirus. Listen to the warning by the Shelby County Health Department. Six weeks ago, our positivity rate was 5.6%. This past week, that number had risen to 14.2%, which is a very alarming trend. Additionally, the number of COVID-19 hospital patients six weeks ago was 129 people. On July 8th, that number had risen to 322, which is a 150% increase. But we have the power to control this. If everyone will wear a mask and say six feet apart, we will slow the spread. If everyone will wash and sanitize their hands, we will slow the spread. And if everyone will get tested, we will slow the spread. And finally, if everyone stays home when you know you're sick, we will slow the spread. We wanna slow the spread and save lives. Please join us in that mission. We have some exciting news. Our Hope Shop is now reopened for in-person business on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They will also still continue curbside delivery. For times and more specific instructions, please visit the website on the screen for more information. Lastly, don't forget that Hope is still accepting requests for small groups to meet in some of our indoor and outdoor spaces. Our youth activities have started meeting again. They wore their masks and stayed physically distant, and it looks like they had a great time being back together. If you wanna book a space for your small group, please reach out to your ministry leader for more details. That's all from me. Let's get back to some worship.
few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this.
It's great having you with us tonight. Two quick things. Again, just a reminder that we'll be having communion together a little later in the service, and if you need to make a quick run to the kitchen to grab enough bread and juice for yourself or for your family, uh, you will not disturb me in the least. Second thing I want to say is thanks. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving during this chaotic time. Uh, thank you for 
um, giving through uh, push pay for uh, writing us a check for uh, having a, a withdrawal, automatic withdrawal. That's what Patty and I do. Um, and we really do appreciate that so that we can keep doing the things that we try to do, not only on this campus, but around the city and around the world, uh, a crazy world. We are uh, beginning a new sermon series this weekend that I'm calling Retweet, Sharing Our Faith. And I'm going to read a, a story today that is custom built for any of us who at some point in our lives have had a special group of really, really good friends. For you ladies, you, you know what I'm talking about, other women who, who you can relax around, women who you can tell anything, women who will defend you when people start talking noise about you, women who are on your speed dial. Guys, your, your, your running dogs, your boys, the guys you have been through the battle with. Here are a few examples uh, from my own life. Here's the uh, Melrose Young Life basketball team photograph. This is from like 1982 or so. Those are my guys right there. Uh, we weren't very good that year, but we did have short shorts. Uh, I still see some of those guys around town. Uh, in, the, in the late 80s, I was the director of a program called the Urban Youth Initiative. And this is me with my students on, on retreat, great people, many of whom are still uh, in the streets working with kids. Uh, here's another squad. This is the Oasis of Hope staff from several years ago. Those are phenomenal people and uh, a great team. Uh, we've got a whole new set of folks that are doing great work there now. When I was on the Ur Urban Young Life staff, there were a group of us who got real, real tight, and I've talked about them before. Uh, working in the inner city does that to you. Uh, but there was a group of us who found ourselves together several times a year. We were inseparable, and here's a, here's a shot of some of them. Uh, there's Larry Lloyd, who is uh, second from the left. On the far left is A.G. Miller from New York. He's a, uh, a professor at Oberlin College these days. He, uh, in African, African American studies, uh, one of my mentors, Verley Sangster, is in the tux. Uh, he's, he was from Chicago. A dentist who was on my left in the photo was from Atlanta, and he had been two things that I will never be, a Black Panther and a defensive back for the Oakland Raiders. He uh, still has a little Panther in him. Good guy. The strong, silent member of the group was Bo. He had been a gang warlord in New York City. He's there on the right. Nobody really messed with Bo. And those, those were my fellas. I got one more. Uh, with, with mask and all these days, here's me and the guys from last month at the funeral of a friend. But I, I want you to meet some fellas here in Mark 2. We read it earlier from the NIV, and let me, let me hit it from another translation. Mark 2, beginning in verse 1, several days later, he, Jesus, returned to Capernaum, and the news of his arrival spread quickly through the city. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for a single person more, not even outside the door. And he, and he preached the word to them. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher. They, they couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd, so they dug through the clay roof above his head and lowered the sick man on his stretcher right down in front of Jesus and when Jesus saw how strongly they believed that he would help, Jesus said to the sick man, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the Jewish religious leaders said to themselves as they sat there, what? This is blasphemy. Does he think he is God? For only God can forgive sins. Jesus, you see, could read their minds, and he said to them at once, why does this bother you? I, the Messiah, have the authority on earth to forgive sins, but talk is cheap. Anybody can say that, so I'll prove it to you by healing this man. Then turning to the paralyzed man, he commanded, pick up your stretcher and go on home, for you are healed. The man jumped up, took the stretcher, and pushed his way through the stunned onlookers. Then how they praised God. We've never seen anything like this before. They all exclaimed. 
I want us to focus on the four friends for a little bit. I, I think they may have something to teach us about sharing our faith. The four friends teach us to get past our own problems. Don't you imagine that these four guys who, who were dragging their friend around town and up and down stairs had problems of their own? Do you assume that they waited until everything was so together in their lives that they had the, the time and emotional strength to help a friend? Listen, we've all got problems. And if we wait until our problems go away to help other people, then nobody gets helped. This, this guy withers away on the street if these guys don't get past their own problems and pick him up. Paul writes these words in Philippians 2. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. I was going over this sermon a few days ago when I came to this version of this verse in Philippians and wish I had a do-over on the sermon title. Faith Through the Roof is a catchy little title and it communicates the essence of the story just fine. But I love this Eugene Peterson paraphrase of Philippians 4, 4 where he says, forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. So I, I'd retitled the sermon, Forget Yourselves. My wife, Patty, is great about this. She, she just forgets about herself. She's a nurse and that's a perfect vocation for her. It's her shape. I've never seen anyone better at putting aside her own problems, and I happen to be one of her biggest problems. Putting aside her own problems to tend to the problems of other people. Uh, these four friends in Mark got past their own problems that day. Here's something else we can learn from them. We can learn to be persistent in love. Be persistent in love. Mark 2, beginning in verse 3, says this. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. We probably all have a mental picture of this story in our heads. Let, let me tell you how the biblical scholars and archaeologists explain it. Jesus was in this small Capernaum home the largest one that has been unearthed by archaeologists is, is 18 feet long. So, so if it was packed with people, like Mark says, there were probably, there may be, they could have put 50, 60, maybe 70 people just crushed into that space. Almost all the homes of that time had, had external staircase that led to the roof. And the, the roof was usually made of wooden beams that would lay three or four feet apart, and then across the beams running in the opposite direction, they would lay thatch and branches uh, that they would then cover with several inches of, of mud or clay. Most of the time, a, a good stand of grass would grow on the roof, which is very, very much like my own house. I, I can't get grass to grow in my yard, but I've got like little, little trees growing in my gutters, but that's, that's something else entirely. These guys and their loving persistence dug a hole in the roof. This is a great story for everybody. Well, everybody but the guy who owned the house. I'd imagine that the four fellows would have looked through the windows to see where Jesus was standing, then hustled up the stairs and kind of calculated where to break through. And Jesus is in mid-sentence when a, when a piece of the ceiling catches him on the shoulder, then another and another. The homeowner pushes his way through the crowd and out the door and around the back of the, uh, the house where the staircase is. But the four guys expecting this to happen, I'm sure, have stationed the most persuasive of the group at the bottom of the stairs with his best, we'll fix it, I promise, speech. Meanwhile, a couple of fingers have broken through the ceiling and then a hand, and once a hand gets in, whole sections of the roof peel away. A face looks through with a smile and probably a wave. A huge section is, is now torn away and the room is filled with light from the hole and suddenly it's dark again because the hole has been covered by a mat of some sort and now the mat is being lowered into the room. A man is on the mat. 
And four men stand up on the roof, looking through the hole, persistent in love. Many years ago now, five or six guys in a small group at Hope decided to be persistent in love with a class at Caldwell Elementary School in the Oasis of Hope neighborhood in North Memphis. These men are a great group of guys from all walks of life. They all have jobs and families and responsibilities, but they decided that they as a group would volunteer as, as tutors at Caldwell one day a week. They'd all go together and they would work with a group of young boys in a particular classroom. And, and, and frankly, the rest is history. These guys in changing lives got their own lives changed, I believe they would tell you. After the kids got out of Caldwell, our, our men followed them to Hume's Middle and then on to Manassas High School. And some of those young kids are now young men. And this small group still connects with them. I, I couldn't be prouder of a group of guys. They're just like, like the friends in this passage, resourceful, passionate, loyal to the core. One more thought. Like the four friends, we need to use our faith to benefit the faith of others. Okay, the, so the drama of the roof is over. Uh, and since the drama of the roof is over, the real drama can now begin. This guy is at Jesus' feet. The four friends are now on their hands and knees looking and listening into this hole. There had been quite a bit of commotion, I would imagine, during the digging and the lowering, and I would imagine it to be dead quiet now because Jesus is about to speak. And in verse 5, we read these words. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm not exactly sure what you'd have done if you'd have been one of the guys on the roof, but I'm pretty sure what I would have done. I think I said, what? Jesus, I don't know if you noticed, but this guy is paralyzed. I appreciate all the sin stuff, but we didn't, we didn't drag him up the steps and rip open the mess of man's roof for you to talk some mumbo jumbo about his sins. No disrespect. But I could say what you just said, and nobody would know if I'd been able to pull it off or not. I'd have said that because I can't see this guy like Jesus sees this guy. Jesus sees the paralysis. He certainly sees it. He, he's seen it since the accident, the accident that made him this way. He just doesn't see the paralysis as debilitating as he does the sin problem. The paralysis is horrible. It's a tragedy. It has defined this dear guy's life and existence. But without Jesus' intervention, his sin problem is about to define his eternity. So we get stuck looking at the outside. I do it, you do it. We do it because it's really about all we can do. We're, we're, we are limited in our abilities. We can't look into some other person's soul. And that becomes very convenient for us. Because if we can keep the outside pretty cleaned up, nobody knows what's going on inside. Jesus wants us to acknowledge what our real sickness might be. Man, these are some tough words that Jesus says in Matthew 23. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. The paralytic's brokenness looked like it was on the outside, but Jesus knew that his real brokenness was on the inside. So on the point of sharing our faith, these four men put their faith into action and their friend's life was transformed. Because of four friends, the paralytic walked away with a healed body and sins that were forgiven. You know, we've talked a good bit tonight about the four friends. Let me make sure you understand something about us today. Because, see, we need to find the healing, the forgiveness that the paralytic found. And I'll bet you this. I'll bet you those new legs carried him throughout his neighborhood so that he could tell people not about his new legs, 
but about his new heart. Isaiah 49, 23 says this, then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. So I ask you, do you, do you need to get healed today? Listen, this gospel story is 2,000 years old, but the gospel, the good news is right now, right this minute. You can end this day just like the paralytic did with a new heart. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29 says this, then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. That is some great news to share with people you love. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word and this story that reminds us to be men and women and boys and girls who carry our broken friends and family to Jesus. Whatever that might look like. It, it's probably not going to look anything like this story. But Father, we get it. We get who we need to be. And Father, we would pray that those friends and family, those acquaintances that we point to Jesus might, might be healed like you healed this young man. Inside first, before you even looked at the outside. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As a family of faith, Tonight, we gather around this table, the Lord's table. But I mentioned to you, um, this is not the stirring table. This is not hope's table. Uh, this is the Lord's table. And if you're gathered with us tonight, wherever you might be, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to participate with us uh, in the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is the way we're going to, to do it in a moment. After I read the words of institution, and say a quick prayer. Uh, we will take uh, the bread first, and we will uh, break off a piece or tear off a piece of bread if that's what you have, and then we'll all partake together at the same time. Then we'll do the same thing uh, with the cup. You know, if you're not in a place in your uh, life where this makes any sense, you're welcome to, to, uh, to watch and to con contemplate this time, uh, but there's no pressure for you to do this uh, in your home tonight. I read from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Let's take a moment and pray and prepare our hearts for this meal. Father God, I thank you for what this moment means to us as Jesus' followers. I thank you for a body that was broken and blood that was shed for the remission of our sins and for the hope of our eternity. Meet us here around our tables. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So he took the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. 
all of you eat this. In the same manner, likewise, he took the cup saying, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Father, that is um, a beautiful moment for those of us who follow you. To be reminded in a very visceral way of a broken body and of shed blood for those of us in your creation. We are so grateful. We are eternally grateful for your grace. And we thank you for meeting us here. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. the side where the baby blue birds fly in great clouds or light walls or blue skies we go fly feel all right and we're gonna woo 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 oh sound like
Receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace give you peace at all times and in every way. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Love you. And we'll see you next week.